first uh, item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of announcements. By reminder of our schedule, we are going on the road uh, down to Mount at the end of this month on Halloween, October 31st. We'll be spending the um, afternoon uh, having our board meeting, um, our regularly scheduled board meeting down at Mount Scutney Hospital. Um, the other uh, work that I wanted to update the board and the public on is the staff at the board, our ACO, all your model staff is uh, working feverishly, intently reviewing the recent submission from One Care um, per Act 113 of 2016. Uh, the board uh, reviews and approves the any ACO who's accepting commercial or Medicaid payments in the state, as well as, as certifying um, ACOs. So um, the submission is on our website. I'd um, encourage folks to take a look at that, and we are accepting public comments on the submission. We are targeting November 20th as a date to have that budget approved. And the uh, and one care will be in October 24th, which is I guess next week already, to present their budget to the board. That's all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, October 10th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, October 10th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, now we're going to move to a discussion on the individual mandate with Agatha and Robin. I was going to just prefer? stay in my seat. Okay. So, Agatha, you're on your own. All right. I can see you better from here, Robin. <laughs> So thank you, good afternoon. Um, I'm here to give an update on the individual mandate report now that the public comment period is closed. So close on Friday. Um, we were here, I was here a couple weeks ago with Jason Levitis and Robin on the line from France um, when we went over the working group's preliminary recommendations. And we just wanted to take a few minutes and update you on the public comments that came in, not only during the public comment period, which is when the majority of the public comments came in, but during the course of the working group's um, discussions this summer. So. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there's just one slide, and it summarizes the public comments. We had, the working group had 18 public comments submitted by people or organizations, um, people on behalf of organizations. They were submitted at each of the working, they were uh, available to be submitted at each of the working group's meeting by email or by phone. Most of them did come in by email, and they were, um, able to be submitted during the public comment period, which is closed on Friday. <coughs> the summary of the public comments, the 18 public comments, and I, I will note that for the purposes of summarizing the public comments, they were categorized based on their main topic. So if a public comment touched on a couple different topics, it was categorized based on its main topic. So of the 18 that were submitted, um, the majority of them, 13, were related to support for maintaining an exemption for health care sharing Ministries, and I say maintain because under the federal structure, there is an exemption for healthcare sharing ministries, and the working group recommends maintaining that exemption. Um, the next cat, Robin, anything you'd like to add to that? No. Nope. Okay. The next category um, of public comments relates to again exemptions and creating a religious exemption for individuals who hold beliefs that are inconsistent with purchasing health insurance, with using health insurance. So in this instance, we say create because under, this would be creating a new exemption. Under the federal structure, there is not an exemption for um, this category, of, uh, this particular category of religious exemption. I would just clarify a little bit. There is a religious exemption. It's just much narrower than this particular suggestion. And this suggestion was modeled on Massachusetts state law. Right. As, as Robin mentioned, there is a religious exemption for that very specific limited scope of people. They're the same people that don't participate in Social Security, for example. 
Um, and then the last category of comments were general, kind of general opposition to a state-based individual mandate. And in that was mixed some, mixed into there some recommendations for alternatives to an individual mandate um, and a penalty. And two of those four comments that were in opposition to a state-based individual mandate cited affordability concerns as their primary concern. And all of the comments are available uh, on the Green Mountain Care Board website in one PDF document, also clicking here. And um, for those of you in the audience who didn't get a chance to see the full report that was released for public comment, that's also posted on the Green Mountain Care Board's website. Uh, the working group met yesterday to review the public comments and decided that they would not make any changes to the pr their preliminary recommendations, so the ones that are in the report that was released for public comment. The group discussed a few minor non-substantive changes, mostly related to grammar, typos, um, reordering some of the slides a little bit, but nothing substantive. Uh, no difference from what you heard two weeks ago. So that concludes the public comment period, and the working group is now on track to finalize the report and submit to the General Assembly on November 1st. So Robin, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think that was a great summary. Um, it might make sense to just uh, reiterate the recommendations that are con contained in the report, which are uh, that, so there are a bunch of different components in, in the report related to uh, an individual mandate, including a definition of minimum essential coverage. Uh, the working group had consensus around a definition with a small legislative change to what's currently in the statute around that, um, and that is indeed de detailed in the draft report. Um, also around uh, the policy around exemptions. Um, so the group discussed exemptions as a policy matter at a higher level, uh, decided to mirror the, the federal uh, exemption policy with some modifications that made sense moving things from a federal to a state level as well as uh, creating an easier affordability exemption than what's currently available at the federal level. And then in terms of, um, and I should say there was one dissent on one exemption in the exemption discussion, otherwise the rest of the group was on the same page. And then, as was discussed two weeks ago, there was a lack of consensus on enforcement with two different recommendations being put forth. One was a penalty modeled on uh, the federal penalty with, again, a modification around the affordability exemption. Um, the report includes a range uh, of a flat dollar amount to be considered for affordability. Uh, and then the second recommendation uh, that had different folks supporting it was uh, outreach and enrollment without a penalty. So the report currently includes two different options for legislative consideration. And as we note, noted last time, the draft currently indicates that the board does not have a position on the substantive policy issues. Um, and so just before we head into, I don't know if you had anything else to add, That's Agatha? It. That's it, thanks. Yeah, so before we head into any discussion, I just wanted to personally thank the members of the working group. Um, they worked hard and consistently throughout the summer, uh, really either meeting or doing research and homework on a weekly basis all summer long uh, to reach uh, where we got to in the report, um, and really stayed focused on the legislative request, which was not actually to discuss mandate or no mandate, but to look at the, the really the nitty gritty weeds of what should minimum essential coverage be? Should there, what kind of enforcement would be appropriate? And really look at those more detailed questions, um, which, you know, quite frankly, in a controversial area is hard to do, but people really stayed on task with that. Um, and uh, I guess that's really what I wanted to kind of say. So in addition so turn to, it over to Kevin. the group, I, I would say thank you, Robin, for um, representing the board well. And thank you, Agatha, as well. This uh, report's back and been uh, very thorough. Um, are there questions for Agatha from the board? Okay. Are there any questions for members of the public? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much. Great, thank you.
So the next item on the agenda is an update from the analytic team. And um, Kate O'Neill is um, ably filling in for Sarah Lindbergh. And Kate, you may want to introduce us to this stranger who's with you. Uh, Stranger? Yes. <laughs> well, I would be happy to. You're wearing those eyes. Yeah, we haven't seen you in a while. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 You're wearing awesome. Hard at work. It's a clip on. <laughs> Can we tell the website? So, hi, thanks for uh, having us here. If you want to go to the home page, I think. Um, so, so it's a quick update on what's going on with the analytics team. Uh, we, we're a small and mighty team of four under Sarah Lindbergh's leadership, but we're adding a fifth staff member. Um, that uh, person is going to be the director of um, special data projects, and the first task on the um, on the list for that um, new position will be devoted to HRAP, so um, we're going to be getting started on that in earnest um, very soon. Um, and I actually will say that we're adding that uh, position to the data team, but it's um, a position that we'll be working um, very closely with Marissa Melamed, so um, a cross-team effort. Um, we are working on turning data into information to help support policymaking and regulatory efforts, and we have a few examples to show you today. Um, one thing we want to uh, share with you, though, is, is to let you know that we leveraged some grant funds to allow us to do uh, an, an evaluation of um, V-Cures and the products um, that result from V-Cures. Um, and we have um, posted a couple of those deliverables on our website, so I want to um, be sure that you know about them. And the, um, and the first is, so this is on the Green Mountain Care Board website from the home page. There's this data and analytics um, link. And in vCures, in this section, um, you'll see that we have a vCure strategic plan and that helps us to focus on how VCURES can support the board's regulatory and oversight responsibilities. And we have a VCURES capabilities document, which is um, a handy table that describes the types of information that's available in VCURES, as well what VCURES can do, and some of the limitations of the data that's in VCURES. Um, so that's, that's pretty handy. Um, and we've also been working on um, developing standard reports, analytic reports. Um, the enrollment trend report is, um, is uh, one that, um, that you'll find interesting. It's got some snapshots, including statewide enrollment by payer, statewide enrollment by age category, et cetera. And um, we've also taken the expenditure analysis and created a data visualization. That's what David's going to share with you today. But before I turn it over to him, um, I want to thank Lori Perry um, for working with David in particular on um, making sure that this is a, um, a, a useful and accurate tool um, and to let you know that you can be on the lookout in the future for some other standard reports. We'll be focusing on um, statewide insurance coverage over time and um, also uh, looking to develop a standard report around the hospital discharge data set. So that's what we've got on our plate. And with that, I'm just going to turn it over to David. Thanks, Kate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so as Kate indicated, my name is David Glavin. I'm one of the statisticians uh, with the A-team at the Green Mountain Care Board. And um, one of our goals or um, tasks that we were, or um, projects that we were tasked with is um, developing um, some ways of providing data to the public for them to be able to use. And in addition to that, also provide some different ways of looking at our standard reports that are developed, such as the expenditure analysis that Lori has developed. So I worked with, um, closely with Lori and um, to validate the data. Now, this isn't the entire expenditure analysis um, 
for 2000, uh, well, released for 2016. This is, these are um, basically interactive graphs, or what we'll refer to as dashboards, or vises, um, that take some elements out of, the, out of that report specific to the resident um, portion of the expenditure analysis report. Analysis report. Um, and um, within that, um, people will be able to navigate, look at some of the different graphs that, um, that Lori has developed, but also there's some interactive abil ability to kind of filter through those or highlight particular areas. Um, and we all have, we have this published right now through a couple of different sources, um, actually one source, um, which is Tableau Public. So I will kind of take you through, I'm basically just gonna take you through a walkthrough of the entire um, database. I'm not gonna really go through the elements of the analysis as those were explained by Lori during the, her presentation, the expenditure analysis. I'm really gonna just show you how the tool works. Um, so this particular, um, well, this, this particular view I also want to um, highlight is that it's limited to just years 2012 through 2016. The limitations on that are because um, the visualizations could become very busy as a result if we ended up putting in more years. So we'll have that sort of as a rolling um, five-year look within this visualization, which I'll update um, annually. and. It'll populate next time we come out with the 2017 information. We'll have views from 2013, obviously, through 2017. Um, and then just a couple of features uh, specifically before I get into the how do we access it. Um, the users can explore different aspects of the report through the interactive visualizations. They can download the data sets used to build the report. And one of the things that I find also is that um, through the interactivity of um, users, they become more engaged in the elements of the report. Um, and it causes, the, I think it, it causes or elicits questions um, to rise and be able to be answered or it might be information that they might want to get back to us with and say, hey, we don't understand necessarily how this works or why is this, why is this trend occurring? Um, so that's, um, that's some of the main features that we wanted to highlight. Um, so let me begin now with navigation, and for those people who are calling in, um, there are two methods to access the visualization. One is through, you can Google um, Tableau Public and click on the link for Tableau Public, and up in the upper right hand corner there's a search bar, and you can either put in Green Mountain Care Board or just GMCB and enter that, and it'll bring up the expenditure analysis report. Um, if it has any sort of relations, as you can see, this is a report, I'm not sure who developed this, but this will also pop up. Obviously, this is a search tool, so if anything on the website has GMCB associated with it, that'll come up as well. So by clicking on the link to the expenditure analysis, that launches the actual visualization itself. And I'll point out this particular view I designed in a standard um, desktop view. I'm going to make a copy of this and I will also have a, a standard laptop view so that it'll size appropriately for laptops. Um, we found that the scaling with some of the Tableau and the automatic version, which is supposed to scale to any um, portable device, doesn't really work very well. Um, and these visualizations I don't recommend using on anything smaller than a tablet, um, for example. So I also recommend when viewing to also use the full screen view, which is located down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and then before I get into the viz itself, let me show you the other method of getting to it. Um, you can access through the, Green Mount the main Green Mountain Care Board um, page, go to the dan data anal analytics pages, which is where we are now or I'm sorry, go to the data analytics page and then launch the analytics report. And that'll bring you to a hyperlink that will take you into Tableau Public, the same site that we were just looking at. Unfortunately, today I was updating this bottom sentence down here and I broke the link. So I have to fix that when I get back. But like I said, because of the, um, the availability through the actual Tableau Public website, you know, we can get, we can access it, so. I, I'm going to fix it when I get back. It was just, I, I was updating just one portion of the, this right before I got over here and I forgot to update the link. So like I said, I recommend that people, um, that people use the full screen mode. I think it's easier to look at and view. Um, but I do want to talk about 
um, two elements. Um, first of all, one is that the browsers, and I have this, um, I don't want to call it a warning, but it's sort of a information that um, the Tableau product is not, is, are not compatible. Um, you, it, it, it'll open up in Microsoft Explorer and Microsoft Edge, um, but the visualizations and the interactivity itself are kind of broken, and that's partially because Microsoft is pushing their own visualization tool, um, and so I, they're, they're not providing the, um, the appropriate updates for this particular visualization tool. So we recommend using Google Chrome, Firefox, or Safari for navigating through um, the, the actual uh, visualization. Um, a couple of elements I'm going to break out of the full screen mode. One thing um, that was pointed out by one of my colleagues is that the visualization tabs to navigate through are located at the top of the screen, and that's not necessarily evident. I think most people will look down to the bottom of the screen and you'll see these forward and backward um, with um, arrows, which may confuse some people, those are actually reset buttons or back undo and redo buttons, and I'll, I'll show you how those work. And there's also the download and full screen capabilities down here. So those are built into the Tableau public site. Um, the actual visualization tabs themselves are located across the top. And I also have highlighted that as well here, so that if people get confused, they can come back to this, or they hopefully look at this page and find that. So the first page I have up is simply a, um, definitions and data sources. It's a very high um, level outline of the categories and data sources that are used to build this particular visualization. Um, so I wanted to, and also describes the population, um, which in this case are Vermont residents, um, regardless of where they receive health care, whether it's in state or out of state. So we have this little chart up here also providing um, a definition for the, the population that we're describing within the, the workbook itself. Um, one element I also want to point out is I have also created a hyperlink that will take you to the full expenditure analysis manual that give you a much more detailed um, description of all of the elements within the um, expenditure analysis. I also noted that this particular view and this particular workbook is limited to just pages 1 through 12, which is the um, resident analysis for Vermont payers exclusively. So if you click on that, actually I think... Oh yeah, it's launching it now. So that will launch, that'll take you to the manual itself, that quick link. Um, in addition to that, I'm going to be adding also a link for the full expenditure analysis as well. So that's, that'll be updated as well. Um, and feel free to stop me at any point as I go through these descriptions um, if you have any specific questions. So the next page is actually our first visualization. Um, and in this, this is uh, resident spend over time. This comes from a couple of different graphs that were um, embedded within the, um, the PDF version of the expenditure analysis. Um, some of the elements here that I want to point out is that there's a tooltip that pops up to kind of give a little bit more information. That's that little white box that you see pops up. Um, to give a little bit more information about specific um, elements within the visualization itself. So in this case, I wanted people to understand that the percent change on top is for the, to it's the total percent change, um, which are associated with these values here as they rise over time or decline over time. And it's from the previous year. So the percent change in this case is from 2012 to 2013. 2012 is not in there. 2011 to 2012 is not in there because we do not have the 2011 data look, um, within this um, visualization. So that is why this particular um, graphic up here is limited to 2013 through 2016, as well as the line graph over here, which is discussed in percent change. Another piece of this, um, including the, the, high, uh, the tool tips within that error, you can click on specific categories. So if um, board members want to use this visualization and they have a discussion or having a discussion, they want to just, just highlight a particular um, portion of the graph, they can click on either the bar graph or they can click specifically on the line graph itself. And in addition to that, I also have it set up so you can actually highlight a specific category um, through the key down on the bottom. And another feature as well <coughs> is that 
if you wanted to select and highlight two, you can hold the control button and they'll highlight two and then you can have a discussion about those values. Okay, I also wanted to point out at this point the download functionality. I'm just gonna highlight, and I'll be coming back to this on a few occasions. Uh, the download element within the workbook or within the, the, the visualization um, worksheet is located down in the lower right-hand corner. And when you select that, it brings up a table of elements that can be downloaded from this workbook. So you can actually do download images, data, crosstab, PDF, and the supporting information will come out. The image and, and the PDF will actually print out an entire um, view of this, so this can, you know, you could print it out into a, 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 I think it comes out as a PNG image, and you could utilize that in a um, PowerPoint presentation if you wanted to. Um, go back to the full screen. So on our next tab, one of the other features that I built into um, some of the visits that you'll see is that you'll be able to filter by year. This particular view, um, none of these other features highlight or do anything. I've shut those elements off. Um, it just gives you a proportion of spend and you can kind of take a look at how those proportions differ over time by selecting each one of the years. Um, I'm in contact with the Tableau development team quite a, quite a bit, and one of the features I'd like to have them be able to put in here is a slide bar that you see. So you can actually kind of slide it and, and dynamically look at those views over to, um, more quickly than having, actually having to select, let it load for a second, and then reset the, the, the different proportion looks or views. And also, um, I've also provided the category breakdown for the two different um, major categories that we're comparing, which is private versus government, and what elements are being, um, are being um, aggregated within each one of those. Um, the next view is the resident spend by provider. Um, first, um, this particular view is a static view over here, just giving the pr proportion of spend um, over time within each of the provider categories. Um, nothing occurs over here. You can't just, you can highlight a specific category, but other, other than that, there's no interaction. They, they are affect, um, and this is obviously not affected by this year filter. The year filter filters both the bar chart at the top and the tree diagram at the bottom, and those two are interacted, active, and related to each other. Um, so when the filter is set for 2016, it will reset both this bar chart and the visualization, what we call a tree map down at the bottom. And I've put a little explanation here on just what to do to change the tree map down here. Um, we have, I have a, what's called a um, hover action um, included with the, in this. And what this does is if you hover over it, it will give you the, the breakdown of the hospital spend, that $2.19 billion in a proportional view down on the bottom here. Now, as soon as I pull off of that, it, it reverts back to all. Um, but this just gives you a quick visualization of the size of the rectangles are, proportion to, are proportionate to the actual spend with each one of those categories, commercial, Medicare, um, Medicaid. And then you'll see on the far right-hand side, there's other. And other doesn't appear, doesn't give you all of the detailed data because it won't fit in that particular sized rectangle. So to supplement that, I've added a little cross tab in here that um, color coordinates by each of those um, categories down below so that if one of the categories doesn't appear due to its size in the rectangular area, you can actually get a look at the um, actual spend amounts that, that is in there. You know, I don't have the um, proportion in there specifically. Um, I could add that in. It got a little busy in overlap on the top, so I didn't add the, the actual um, percentages within each one of these. But as you slide down and hover over each one of these, it will change based on the, in this case, physician, government, health activities. This, this portion gets changed over so that you're, and, and also the date will also change when you select the specific date so that people are aware of what they're looking at at a specific time. So now in this case, we're looking at drugs and supplies. Um, and then the, the um, title down below on the tree diagram indicates that. Um, so, and then I'll move on to the resident cross, spend cross tab. 
This is actually Lori's specific cross tab. That she, this is one of the cross tabulation reports that she has within the expenditure analysis. Um, it tends to get very busy on the eye when you look at her, the full breakdown. So um, I decided to create some, basically a subcategory for providers to, for people to be able to um, get a little bit more detailed view within each one of these provider categories over here. And as you break that down, it will mimic, um, we actually cut out one level, but it'll mimic um, the exact report that Lori has in the expenditure analysis in PDF form. Um, this is also filterable, filterable by year. And in addition to that, we also have um, the ability to look at both the a dollars cross tab and the percent breakdown cross tab by providers and spender types or payer types. And then just to point out, and I was gonna put a little tip in here for people to actually access this little plus sign because it's not real obvious, but one of the important things that I feel with visualizations and I wanted to build into this is that people, to interact, you know, I want people to explore and kind of click on things and figure out, well, why did I break this or what's going on here? And when you find this little plus sign here, what that does is it opens this up and creates those subgroups so that you can get the um, more detailed look within administrative and net cost. Dental is obviously its own, um, drugs and supplies, et cetera. And those are also viewable with the percent. These are two separate dashboards, so you actually, if you want to look at, you have to actually click on this percent as well. Now, at this point, I also want to point out, if you get it, if a user gets to this point and they're like, all right, well, how do I go back? You can either click on the minus sign, it'll reset it, or this is, this is where those features that I was talking about earlier down below, there's a back button that will take you back to your previous view, and in fact, it will take you back all the way to the previous view. These work specifically with the particular dashboard or tab that you're on. There's also a full reset, and that'll reset the entire dashboard back to its original view and setting, including the 2000, so I'll just show you as well. If you have 2013 selected, you do a reset. It'll reset to the original view when you opened up the page. And then the final look that we have here is actually not a dashboard or interactive dashboard. This is a what we call a sheet within the um, software environment. Um, but this is the actual data that was used to build the entire visualization. Um, and as I stated earlier, those data sources that were used to aggregate this information um, are located within um, uh, the explanation that is located within that definitions um, page. This, all this information is included within um, Lori's expenditure analysis. So none of this information that we're putting out there is new um, information. Um, in addition, so if, if, you if you go to the download page on this, actually, I gotta, you have to be out of full screen mode to do that. Um, let me highlight a couple of the elements here. Um, if you click on the download again, in this case, you can either choose a data or cross tab, any one of these, the PDF, I mean, these are not interesting. What you wanna be able to do is load this as a data, um, dot, or a data file or a cross tab file, so you can either load it into new software or just use it as an Excel spreadsheet and create pivot tables or what you want, whatever you want to do. So this cross tab an element, element, click on the download, click OK, it'll download a, and open up the Excel spreadsheet. And we get all sorts of errors. I think the IT recently updated this. Um, and this is exactly the data set that I worked with to build um, this entire report. There's one feature I want to point out, and this, you know, um, anybody can use this, and I, like I said, you, and one of the other features that I've also built into this is the filtering element. So you can filter by year, if you want to just compare a couple of years. If you're just looking specifically at a, a group of providers that you wanted to um, select, then that's also filterable as well. Um, and if you're in this and you want to get back, or, you know, quickly get back without having to click on each one of those buttons, you can use the reset tool at the bottom to reset back to the full data, data set. There's one last element I want to point out um, in case anybody has questions. Two possibilities for downloading the data set are located down here. Um, the second is this data 
And this is actually comes out as a text file. Actually, it doesn't load into it does load into a CSV file, not a text file. And when I refer to CSV, I mean it'll open up in Excel. Um, this is a more detailed look uh, at the at the data. I recommend people use the cross tab because that's the data that, that's really relevant to this. A lot of this is other data elements that I had to build within it to, to make some of those visualizations work. So somebody who knows how to use Tableau would understand this. Um, there's it's just manipulation of that original data set to have some of those views look a different way or not have things subset. Um, Etc. So, um, and then if you click on show all columns, that really gives you everything that I built into it. So, really, this is not useful except for someone who would be, um, who has some background with Tableau. Um, and I don't remember how to close that out. Okay. And let me think. Finally, I do want to talk about one other download element, and then I think this can get a bit confusing as well. People may want to click on this download piece in the upper right hand corner. Um, that will download the Tableau workbook, package workbook, with all the data elements in it, exactly as, as, I, as, it, as, it, as I built it and downloaded it to the website here. Um, this also comes up in the download um, link down below. Um, that will let download a, a Tableau document that can only be opened up in Tableau. There are some free reader versions, so if people want to be able to manipulate the visualizations, they also have that ability to, but you need to have the Tableau software. And I think I probably went a little bit over. I apologize, but um, are there any questions? Questions for David? I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that I love the interactivity. I think that's fabulous, and I think it'll be helpful for us as board members as well as for lots of other folks. Thank so you. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, I had a couple questions on, if you go back to the chart that had kind of the cross tab yes. page, I think. This one? Uh, or yeah. the full data just, set? Just a couple of questions on, um, and it may be in you know, how the data is provided, but if you look at hospitals, for instance, mm -hmm. um, how are like drugs and supplies and physicians and things like that that occur within the hospital, are they separated out or? Not within this, look, not within this view. Okay, so it's, what's well, they, they are to this degree. Um, are you talking about th th this element here? Um, where we do have a further breakdown, so I have, um, for exact example, other professions. Those sub subgroups that Lori provides in the full um, cross tab look that you'll get in the that's what this is here. Okay. This, but this, the hospital just includes all spending that's in the hospital. Yeah, I, 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 I'm presuming that that's a question that you would have to ask Lori. Okay, I'm, that's not, what I thought. I'm not particularly familiar yeah. with the true analysis. She's the expert on that, so I'll defer that. And similarly, when you look at the out of pocket column, is right there here. a way to do that by payer type? I mean, is there? No, that's not built in there. The, the only places I have that built in are in other views. For example, I think it's actually, it's in the, <laughs> and I thought, oh, we did, um, I do have to put that disclaimer in here. We, So here I do have out of a pocket spend by, I think I have the reverse of what you wanted to yeah, look at. That's okay, I just didn't know, you know, those would be interesting things and it's probably in the data set. That yeah, and I, I do encourage, you know, that's one of the things too, I, I encourage um, feedback on this because this is a living document um, and I'm happy to update or add extra looks if people want those built in. Um, so if you have anything, um, any other views that you want to look at or, you know, can it do this, um, you can feel free to, you know, email me or you can just turn around and <laughs> holler I can at just me. ask you. <laughs> and, and the final one and that would be any way to correlate lives or, you know, by kind of type. So obviously That's commercial. not built in. The, that yeah. data is not built in here. In fact, let, let me just go back. I'll no, no, that. I think it's not. I mean, well, this is, like I said, if you look at this here, this is what the data set is built on. So it's built on year, provider, the payer types, and then the expenditure then this is an aggregate um, value for expenditures within each, within each one of these sets. Okay. okay. So that is, that, so if, if, if you look at the, the original, so if you download this, it's the exact Excel spreadsheet or CSV sheet that I worked off of to build this entire workbook. So those are the only four data elements that are provided within this, or that were used to build this entire workbook. So. Okay, great. No, but I, I think it's a great tool. I'm just trying yeah, to there, and there are ways that we could, you, you could link and launch another viz 
to answer some of those questions, and we could we can discuss that. And uh, you know, that's a little bit more complex right. um, process, but I'm happy to to build that. So great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for David? Not is there any uh, public uh, question or comment? Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Exciting stuff that the 18 is doing. Yes. Okay, at this time we're going to uh, switch gears and uh, have a conversation about Michael. If we could invite Mike and his team to come down. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for allowing us to present this uh, update today. Uh, my portion of the uh, presentation will be relatively brief because we have very qualified people here at the table to update you on the various aspects of our operation. So let me introduce them. Uh, to my right is uh, Christina Chaquet, who is this Chief Operating Officer of Vital. To my far left is Bob Turneau, who is the CFO of Vital. And to my immediate left is uh, Frank Harris, who is the Strategic Technology Advisor. Just to sort of give you a brief overview before we launch into some of the specifics, I'm happy to report to the board that we have accomplished much, actually, in my estimation, an incredible amount of progress over the last eight months, and you will see that in our presentation, as well as, I believe, the state's presentation. But there's definitely more to do. In short, we've hit our marks uh, in accordance to the work plan, but we must continue to work hard and continue uh, to uh, move forward in our progress. Uh, this progress would not have been possible without the leadership that you see here uh, on my left and right and a remarkable and hardworking and dedicated staff. We've, uh, uh, it is amazing what has happened in eight months. Uh, it also wouldn't have been possible without the support from the Green Mountain Care Board, the legislature, and particularly uh, Michael Costa and Emily Richards from the state of Vermont, as well as our partners out there. It's been a humbling and incredible experience as we have, uh, as we have progressed in, shown progress in the last eight months. In 12 to uh, 16 months, I will be leaving this position, but I am gaining confidence that Vital can fulfill, gain, I have confidence that Vital will fulfill its role in delivering more efficient delivery of care at the point of care in healthcare reform and in the introduction of innovative technologies to assist clinicians and perhaps even the patient. I also want to thank the board um, because this is the only opportunity I get to thank the board for their recent action in the hospital budget process to urge both vital and hospitals to seek ways to promote electronic consent. This will help in a, in a large way. It's a great step. And we are also hopeful in the upcoming legislative session that we will um, pursue the idea of a more broader uh, resolution to the consent issue that we've been talking about for the last few years. So we'd like to start this review today with uh, 
Bob and a financial operations review and uh, and go from there. So, Bob. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bob Trineau, CFO for Vital. Uh, I'd like to thank um, the board for allowing us to, to bring them an update of the progress that we've made at Vital. Today I'd like to go over the financial statements for our audited uh, FY17 and also our unaudited FY18 results. Um, we are currently in process with our FY18 audit with Gallagher Flynn. This is the first year of that audit with uh, Gallagher Flynn. And um, we hope to be able to present to the board in um, December the results of that audit. This chart is similar to one that we presented to the Green Mountain Care Board during the budget review this spring. I've updated it to reflect the finalization of FY17 um, for the audit, along with um, the latest draft for our unaudited revenue projections for FY18. Um, we believe that, uh, excuse me, and also um, I've added into that we will be very close with our FY19 um, projection. Um, we are still working to finalize um, the FY, the CY19 contract with DIVA. That contract begins January 1st um, and runs a full calendar year. Typically, our contracts with DIVA have run um, in accordance with our fiscal year, and this is the first year that we will be um, using a calendar year uh, contract. We will be back hopefully in um, mid-November to discuss the results of the negotiation with DIVA. Um, but from where we stand right now, we believe that we're very close um, with DIVA in terms of numbers and scope. Um, before I leave this chart, um, I do need to mention the tremendous effort that has been done by Vital's team this year. Um, we completed 100% of our deliverables, including 100 new um, and replacement interfaces, which is uh, a huge lift, um, and it was uh, a great uh, success by our operations team. Can you break that down between replacement and new? Christina, can you? Um... Uh, it's roughly 35% each year. I would say this year is probably more around 40% um, replacements. I'm sorry. Okay. So 60% of? Uh, yeah, I, I can double check the number, but that's, that's my rough estimate. Okay. Again, this chart is similar to the expense chart that was shown during the budget review this spring. Um, the takeaway here is that the reduction in expenses uh, during FY18 when we compare it to FY17 was the result of labor cost reductions. Um, we reduced headcount by seven employees in FY, between FY17 and 18. We also have deferred technology projects so that we can reevaluate our technical direction. And Frank is going to talk a little bit about that um, following my presentation. FY19 continues this trend of reduction in expenses. This chart compares VITAL's FY18 budget, the one that the Green Mountain Care Board approved in um, the spring of 2017 for our FY18, <coughs> with our unaudited results for FY18. If you'll notice, we've come within 1% of our budgeted revenue for the year. Um, in addition, our expenses, as, as I've discussed, have been impacted by reductions in labor and also the pause that we took in the development of new technical projects until our reevaluation was complete. 
We do expect to move out on several new technology program projects this year in FY19. Um, again, Frank will address the vital technology in his section. And as we mentioned in our budget review this spring, the surplus that has been generated will position us well for future periods where we're facing reduced funding. Moving on to the balance sheet, VITAL is in a much stronger financial position than it has been in prior years. This, in FY18, we closed with over 100 days of cash on hand. Um, this has been driven by um, our aggressive approach to reducing expenditures. Um, we expect to use this surplus to cover our reduced funding in 2020. Since June, VITAL has been working on three audits. We completed our FY17 audit following the state's review in July, and we undertook an operational audit with KPMG, which I'll speak about in a moment, in August. And now we are working to complete our FY18 audit, which is expected to complete in December. The operational audit, which was conducted by KPMG was a recommendation for the HTS report. The audit had five objectives, to assess the existing financial policies, to assess work practices of vitals, to also advise on steps to take to operationalize those policies, to determine if there were any missing policies, and also to take a look at our accounting system. The results of that audit were 12 observations, which range in the potential for a control gap from high to low. There are two high, there are six mediums, and there are four lows. The findings were, were not a surprise for us um, in terms of our size. We face typical in, issues of an organization of our size in terms of segregation of duties, operational redundancy, ensuring that the processes that VITAL um, does in terms of its finances are carried out um, consistently when a change in personnel has occurred. We have been addressing KPMG's observations uh, since we got the report, and I'm happy to report that six or half of them are either in process or have been uh, completed. So with this report uh, to the Green Mountain Care Board, you can see that VITAL is positioned to be a stronger organization. We've made the hard decisions over the past year. Our staff has worked hard to make positive change, and we are at a better place than we were a year ago. So that concludes my section. Any questions? I have one. I think, as I recall, you were carrying a about $130,000 contingency for an outstanding audit finding that had not been resolved. But as I look at this document, it looks like um, it has been resolved, so I'm just checking to make sure that's true. Um, it has been resolved. We still have to work out the mechanics of uh, payment to the state, whether it's a, an offset in, to an invoice or whether it's a direct payment, but we're, the state and VITAL are both in agreement as to the amount of the credit due to the state. Thanks. I had one as well on the financial sustainability. When you talk about um, 2020 losing funding and you're kind of putting money in the bank in 2018, you, you came up with a million dollars extra, but what does that look like for 20? I mean, do you know what your funding will be versus your expenses yet? And then going forward, how sustainable is that? What's gonna happen in 21? You know, if, this year you kind of have a piggy bank, you, you put up this piggy bank, but that's, 
tough to run like that. Mike, you want to take that one? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, that's a very good question and one that we sort of, when we presented the budget in the spring, talked about the three years, the 19, the 20, the 21. As we look at 20, we'll be, uh, as we're looking at it now and we're reducing uh, the, the revenue that's going to be coming from us in an agreement with the state, it was a mutual agreement that we made with the, with the state. We project that we'll have an operating deficit in 2020, where this will have enough cash to, to cover that operating def deficit, where the rubber meets the road is in 2021. And there are two avenues that we pursue. One of them is talking about financial uh, sustainability. This was no surprise to us. We have to diversify our revenues. And this gives us a couple of years in order to do that, in order to diversify our revenues, find more revenue sources in order to do that. We're in the process of working through those various options right now. If that doesn't transpire, we'll have to cut again uh, and, and look at ways in order to cut uh, about half a million dollars in 20, 2020. I'm optimistic, frankly, you know, over the next two years that we'll be able to find half a million dollars in revenue, in incoming revenue as we move forward. But there is the contingency plan of further cuts that will make us sustainable going into the future after 2021 if we have to. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Frank Harris. I'm Strategic Technology Advisor for VITAL. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a couple of initiatives, a couple of key initiatives that we have going on in the technology area. Um, the, the first one we're calling the V High Future Platform Initiative. And what we're doing with this one is we're taking a critical look at our current architecture and really the big features that I'm referring to are, uh, as you're probably familiar, uh, we use a vendor today, Medicity, um, which is really, in, in short, uh, our point of care system that provides a, a portal for clinicians to use and looking at healthcare data. And then uh, the HDM data services platform, the health data management platform, and that's really uh, intended to provide uh, data for analytic uh, activities. And so why are we doing this? Well, the, the, the first uh, thing is that um, in the uh, HTS evaluation report, you're probably all familiar, the, the question was raised about whether there was an opportunity for VITAL to simplify and consolidate its architecture. And, and uh, always a really good question um, with two components like that. Um, and so we wanna look very carefully at that. Um, the second thing is that the HDM is a self-developed capability, and um, one of the strategic principles that we've um, uh, espoused in our technology strategy is that we're not going to develop capabilities like this unless there's a compelling reason to do that. And so we want to take a really critical look at this and see, uh, is that the best path forward for us, or should we be thinking about a vendor uh, system that we could purchase? Um, and then the, finally, the last thing is that we always want to be taking a critical look at, at uh, what we're doing. Um, one of the things that we say in our technology strategy is we're not going to be wedded to uh, uh, particular solutions. We're going to keep an open minded about how we approach our technology solutions. And, and uh, we want to be sure that we've got an optimal solution. So is, is the Medicity platform, are they providing the optimal capabilities? Um, is there a way for us to accelerate the value proposition for the VHI by perhaps leapfrogging our current path and, and taking a different road. Um, so the process, the first thing we want to do is a feasibility study, and that's what we're beginning now. Really, th this, is a, this would be a very significant effort for the company um, and, and uh, for the VHI effort, and, and we want to look very carefully at it before we do a lot of investment of time here. Um, and so the first question is, is there a high value replacement? We, we're going to look at the marketplace and try to really be confident that there's a better solution out there than what we currently have. 
Um, I always think about the devil you know versus the devil you don't know, and, and it's easy to see the flaws in your current platform. A lot of times, you know, you can be looking at a new solution, it looks more optimistic, you gotta be really careful about that. And then the second thing is, can we actually conduct a project? Um, there's obviously significant costs, both in terms of dollars and, very importantly, opportunity costs, because it would take a lot of the focus of the company to change platforms, and so we wanna look at that carefully, and then also, what are the resources required? human resources and any other resources needed. So we're targeting completion around the end of calendar year 2018 to complete the feasibility study. And then if, it, if we uh, determine that it's feasible and advisable to proceed, we'll move on to a full RFP, uh, the, the associated planning and budgeting and approvals. And we want to we want to complete this effort prior to the Medicity contract renewal, which comes up in June of 2019. Next slide. Um, the second effort I want to mention is the uh, VHI transition to the cloud. And, and really here, we're referring mostly to the HDM part of the infrastructure uh, that is currently hosted on uh, owned hardware at a data center co-location site in South Burlington. Uh, and um, we, we want to look at, is there an opportunity to uh, take a better path in getting meeting our infrastructure needs? Why do we want to do this? It's the same reason most companies are looking at this, or many, many companies are looking at this these days. One is to avoid large capital expenditures and the obsolescence of assets that, that comes with those uh, capital investments uh, over time. Um, that's difficult to manage. Um, and uh, we also expect that we will see reduced costs and um, a much more predictable and consistent operating expense. And then finally, uh, significantly improved agility uh, to, to rapidly scale up or down and to only pay for what you actually use. A lot of times when companies are uh, purchasing capital assets, you've got to sort of anticipate what am I going to need in the first few, in the next few years. You've got some idle capability there, so um, one, that's one of the advantages. Um, a big question that usually comes up very quickly when you start to talk about this kind of thing is, is it secure? And the, the short answer is yes. There's, there's really no reason to be fearful about taking this approach. It has every bit um, of the security that uh, you need, but it's not magic either. It's got to be properly managed, just like when you're running your own infrastructure. And certainly that's our intent. Uh, many companies are running secure applications out of, out of the cloud per, with personally identifiable information or intellectual property, it's very commonly done. Uh, and major cloud vendors have consistent, well-vetted practices, and this is one thing that's not uh, often not intuitive. You've got a major um, uh, technology company that is managing the infrastructure in a consistent, reliable way, and there can be some advantages from a security perspective with that approach. Uh, our transition is, uh, the, our strategy is um, that, first of all, Medicity is already what, what you would call private cloud-based, and I have that in quotes. It really just means that it's a dedicated purpose cloud. Uh, the HDM would be transitioning to a public cloud, again in quotes, meaning that it's a general purpose cloud that many companies use. And, it w and we've chosen a major cloud vendor, which is Microsoft Azure. Um, and the transition that we see ourselves going through first, um, an effort that's currently underway, is to, is to establish off-site backups for all of our data in the cloud, N not only all of our data, but all of our as uh, assets associated with the HDM, the servers, et cetera. The next part is around design and engineering and business impact analysis, so really understanding what are the critical systems, what are the recovery objectives, how are we gonna engineer this thing then to establish disaster recovery in the cloud, so, so uh, to prove that the infrastructure works in the cloud and also to um, establish a better disaster recovery capability, and then finally flipping production to the cloud, and you do that in two different sites. Uh, so we're contracting for that first step for backups now, and the implementation duration is about a, a month once the work begins. So I'm glad to take any questions. I had one. Um, I was curious if you had any discussions with DIVA or the Agency of Digital Services about uh, using similar cloud vendors and whether there'd been any ad anything advantageous about that. I, didn't, I don't know how the pricing works, so I don't know if that like might help with the pricing, but I was just curious about uh, that, whether those discussions uh, 
happened and if that makes any sense. Yes, we, we, we have um, been collaborating with the folks from ADS pretty closely on this and, and expect to continue to do that. The first part of the effort is, is relatively straightforward to establish backups um, and, and the, the data is encrypted in the cloud and so it's, it's, you know, it's relatively straightforward. As we get further down the road, it starts to get more complicated and, and more decisions to be made and we'll continue to collaborate with them all along the way on this. Other questions? Thank you. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Christina Shokhead. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Vital. And I need the clicker. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll walk you through the operational progress that we've made at Vital. So the target for uh, patient consent, again, that means uh, any patient who has consented to have their information uh, accessible within the VHI. Um, our target for December 31st is 35% of all Vermonters in the VHI um, having consented in, and we have already surpassed that number, and we're not stopping. We are trying to maintain that momentum, and again, I would like to thank the Green Mountain Care Board during the budget review. We've um, been in conversation with uh, a few hospitals, uh, not only about consent, but that has also uh, generated more interest in them actually accessing the data themselves, doing more of an integrated, what we're uh, starting to call uh, cross-community access, where they would actually retrieve the data electronically right within their EHR, um, which reduces the burden on providers to actually um, sign on to a separate portal. So again, thank you very much. Much. Um, hoping to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm getting it up there, but yeah. still, um, I'm sure you'll agree that even though it's about 35%, it's not really. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I would, I would agree. <laughs> so thank you. Moving on to the actual utilization of the data, again, for those patients who have consented in. This slide shows you, and it might be a little difficult to see with the colors. So the bottom line, um, that green, that shows the number of queries that uh, the VHI or uh, providers of the, that utilize the VHI, as well as anyone using the Veterans Affairs uh, Lifetime Electronic Record. That shows you the number of queries um, that are being exchanged looking for data on uh, Vermonters. And then the top line is the provider portal, the number of unique patient queries uh, that providers are using, signing on using Vital Access, uh, that, that portal product. Any questions before I move on? Okay. Yeah, I would just have a question on the, sure. the trend when you look, you know, from yeah. March 18 to, you know, July, right? It was trending down. Yeah. And then you had a big jump, which is good, and then trending a little bit. I mean, where do you see that going? Like, why was it trending down? Yeah. Because more people were getting on there. It, do, it does fluctuate, and some of that is based on the, the need to actually look at patient information. Um, you'll notice a lot of times as you head into flu season, it gets a little bit more use. Um, other times it could be providers have transitioned out of organizations, and then as their replacement comes on within an organization, we provide that access. So that might also impact the number of queries. Um, the other thing that has been going on, which is why you might see some drastic fluctuations, is we've been taking the staff and going out and retraining providers. And so based upon when those trainings get set up, you might see a spike um, occur as they start to really understand how to utilize the system better. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Thanks. Okay. 
This is a slide, I think we showed this for the first time at the last um, board meeting, and we'd like to um, continue to show this. Um, this is really a critical part that maybe um, Vital has not told this story well in the past. Um, but one of the valuable aspects of uh, getting data into the VHI is electronically sharing that, um, again, integrated into the provider's EHR. And so so results delivery, think laboratory, radiology, and transcription information is um, really occurring background um, to a provider because it's being delivered right within their EHR. And um, typically, we send about 140,000 um, messages a month, and that message may contain one or several test results. Um, so we're just giving you the message count. And it fluctuates anywhere from, uh, I would say around 600 providers every month um, typically get results. It's dropped a bit um, in September um, simply because we had a hospital go offline and so the hospital owned practices um, are switching to another EHR and so we're we're working with them to get them back up and running when they do that switch. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this um, results delivery actually does not require patient consent because the provider who ordered the test is on that message, and so we can safely and confidently um, provide that information directly to that provider that ordered the test. Um, so it really depends upon the organizations that say we're ready to move away from facts because they kind of you know, they like, you know, the, the way that they've always been getting the information. Um, and it sometimes does take, um, you know, a, a way to change in the organization to get really comfortable with having something electronically. So again, a, a push to try and have that happen more and more and deliver more of those um, results. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So one of the other areas that um, HTS really focused on in their report is to reduce the number of uh, duplicate records in the VHI. Again, we want to make the uh, tools and the services that we use useful and valuable. And there was roughly 35% uh, of the records that are in the VHI are considered duplicate. Uh, some of that was we needed to change our algorithms in order to strengthen that matching and also work with organizations to make sure that they're sending us robust data. And then beyond that was actually going in and cleaning up some of the data that needed to be merged based on the, the stronger um, patient matching. So we're hoping to go from 35% of the records being duplicate down to 21% by December, by the end of December and um, by making a 40% reduction. For at the end of September, when we began our testing, we just missed our target. We hit 33% of the records being duplicate. Um, the good news is, um, even though it's October 17th, we are at 28.1%. So we are well on the way, uh, well on the way of meeting our October target. And by the end of October, we're hoping that we're well into the November target of 25%. <coughs> Any questions before I move on? I think that might be the last one. And that is the last slide. Okay. Questions for any of the uh, panelists from the board? No, we'll open it up to the public for any uh, questions or comments. Yes, Mike. Um, just had a question about what duplicate means. Does, does mm -hmm. duplicate mean that if there's two records of me which are identical, mm -hmm. in which case I'm not so worried? Um, or if duplicate means there's two records of me uh, with different sets of information that's pretty darn concerning. 
<laughs> yeah. So a, a duplicate record, um, the term that we would that we would use would mean that there's a record out there that we can confidently say with a 95% uh, confidence level or higher that that patient record is really the same as another record that we see. If it's below a 95% confidence level, we do not want to um, merge that record. So that, does that answer your question? Not exactly. I think the question is whether the content of the, uh, of the two duplicate records is, maybe, maybe we don't know, maybe you don't know that, but if, if I'm a provider and I'm looking at the patient and yeah. there's two or three of that person, then you're not sure that you have the most recent or an accurate record. Yeah. Right, exactly. That's why we want to reduce the duplicate. So we could get uh, a record in from one hospital, and it could have, let's say, your name, your address, um, and your date of birth, but it does not have a middle initial. And then we may get another record, which does have different clinical information, you know, the potential of different clinical information because it's been documented at a different hospital. And we have your name, we have your address, we have a middle initial, and we have um, a phone number and gender, and we're pretty sure it's the same. It's the same record. Um, we do really stringent te testing in order to make sure that we are confident, again, 95% or higher, that it is the same person before we we say that those two records are, and I would say, linked, not merged. So when a provider goes into the VHI, clicks on that um, record, they can see all of that data and who delivered that data, which hospital. I think the key point that you said is merged, right? And so it's not that you're deleting one record. Correct. It's not that you're merging. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The information is not lost. It's collected. It's honest. Right. That yeah. You have it exactly right. Other questions or comments? Yes. On the same topic, um, this must be a Herculean effort to mm -hmm. reduce the um, duplicate counts. And really, two questions. What's the ongoing continuous improvement process mm -hmm. to prevent it from happening in the first place? Yeah. And then, in terms of output, what happens to counts? Mm -hmm. of the linked and or merged records. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really great questions. Thank you. Um, it's almost like you're living my world. <laughs> so, so we've done um, we've done a few things. Again, we've been working with the data contributors to make sure that they understand the need to send us really clean data. Um, make sure that it's robust information again, so that we can do better matching. We're more confident. We're getting that middle initial. We're getting all of those relevant data points to do better matching. Again, we've strengthened our algorithm. It's helpful um, now that we've been operational for a while to be able to go in and say, what data points are we getting? Where are we getting it from? How do we change our algorithm to best match the type of data that we're getting in Vermont? Um, and we'll be back to talk about something called the connectivity criteria, which is something that um, we we expect for all organizations to um, utilize going forward, really supporting that we get really good data. And we're using um, part of that now um, in order to get the data to keep the matching going. We've been working with our vendor to go back and clean up any of those records that we might have gotten in before those changes were made, and we have to link them co correctly. We went from uh, using a tool that we implemented, wanted to really make sure it worked, and now it works in the background 24-7, and we're able to actually um, stop it, take a look, make sure that everything is, is okay, and we're moving forward in the future with that. Answer your question? Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
So Emily, if you could come down. Emily Richards, the director of the Health Information Exchange Program at DBA, um, and I'm here to provide a. Sorry, oh, you can't hear me. <laughs> better is that better? Yeah. You know, being a someone who testifies to the Green Mountain Care Board really requires you to be able to project. I don't think I I took that lesson. <laughs> Um, so, sorry for those who couldn't hear me. My name is Emily Richards. I'm the director of the Health Information Exchange Unit at DIVA, and I'm here to provide um, one of our bi monthly progress updates on the progress that DIVA and Vital are making uh, towards the requirements listed in Act 187. So the focus of the update today is, again, those Act 187 requirements. We'd like to uh, give you an update on progress made to date since the passage of that act, as well as uh, discuss the HIE plan, which will be formally presented to you on November 7th. Okay. So apologies for the repetition, but um, you likely remember that these are the requirements uh, that were listed in Act 187 of 2018. Uh, both DIVA and VITAL are on track uh, in terms of uh, uh, meeting the requirements or the objectives listed in that act. So starting from the top here is a work plan with timelines and objectives uh, that was intended to provide the General Assembly and the board with an understanding of the activities that would occur uh, over this year uh, to implement the recommendations list listed in the Act 73 of 2017 evaluation report that was delivered to you on May 1st. Um, Bi-monthly since May, we've been also providing progress updates uh, in written form and obviously coming in front of you as well. Um, so you received them in May, July, and September, and the next one is due in November. In each of those progress updates, we've included uh, updates the activities listed in the work plan so you were sure of the detail behind uh, progress being made towards each of the activities listed in the work plan um, and uh, more recently vital has provided the dashboards with it, which they've just presented to you uh, an additional requirement of Act 187 was a contingency plan. Um, this was to be developed by a third party and triggered in the event that VITAL could not meet the uh, recommendations from the Act 73 of 2017 report. Capital Health Associates was contracted to do that contingency plan. Uh, we discussed it in our last update and it was delivered on September 1st. Uh, additionally, there's a third party evaluation. Health Tech Solutions, the authors of the Act 73 report, came back um, and did an ongoing evaluation of DIVA and Vital's progress, which I'm hoping to talk to you about in more detail today. Um, we're going to be submitting uh, a health information technology plan, which we're calling the Health Information Exchange Plan, to you on November 1st. Um, hopefully I can provide a little bit of color on that today, and then we're looking forward to our time with you on the 7th to talk about it in more detail. Um, in mid-January, DIVA will also be providing General Assembly and the Board with a consent policy uh, recommendation. Uh, the General Counsel at DIVA, as well as Michael Costa, have begun meeting with stakeholders uh, to gather their input. Uh, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, VITAL, uh, ACLU, and others. Um, so we're hoping that um, this is a process that engages stakeholders and reflects uh, the broad range of uh, opinions on that, that change in policy. And finally, in mid-December, we'll be delivering a report on how to improve the utility and interoperabilities of EHRs and HIE, although you'll likely see that in the HIE plan as well. Okay, so specific updates. 
So since our uh, last meeting together, a couple of things have happened. As I mentioned, Capital Health Associates, contracted by DIVA, completed a contingency plan. Um, so this contingency plan would be called into action if VITAL cannot meet the requirements or is deemed unable to operate the VHI. Um, we're assuming that this uh, activity is complete. Uh, we will only revisit it in the event that it's necessary. HealthSec Solutions also completed their third-party evaluation, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, also in September, um, we at DIVA kicked off what we're calling the HIE Plan Roadshow. Um, this was an effort to engage stakeholders in the HIE planning process, uh, make sure that uh, folks knew what the HIE steering committee was up to, what would be included in the plan, and how HIE efforts would be governed going forward. Additionally, the, um, as I mentioned, the steering committee, they're working to finalize the HIE plan. This, as we've talked about, is a small group of dedicated folks who've worked really diligently over the last 10 months to come up with a consensus-driven plan. Um, so that will be to you um, on or before November 1st. And as Vital talked about, we are working to finalize our contract um, that will begin in calendar year, or excuse me, January 1st of 2019 for calendar year 2019. So. All of the sort of progress that you're seeing, the activities that are, will be listed in the HIE plan as essential, the work that we've been doing over the last year will be reflected in those contracts. So um, things like patient matching, the consent rate, uh, the security of the system, all of those items will be touched on in the calendar year 19 contract. Okay, so the third party evaluation. So as you likely recall, um, Act 187 of 2018 included this language, the results of an evaluation which shall be conducted by an independent entity with expertise in health information technology of the work plan, the contingency plan, and the department and vitals progress towards implementing the rec recommendations in the Act 73 report. So HTS focused their evaluation on that work plan um, because they felt that the activities that we had listed were in direct alignment with the recommendations from their Act 73 report. And just like you, they've been reviewing our progress through the progress updates bi-monthly. We've been sitting down with them to provide greater detail on the activities listed. In some events, you know, they needed additional documentation or um, uh, greater clarity on uh, unique or uh, individual activities, um, but generally speaking, they've been uh, sort of reviewing the same progress updates that the General Assembly and Board have received. So through their evaluation, they found that um, HIE work conducted by the state and vital is either complete or making sufficient progress. So what you see in the green and yellow here are items that they considered complete, and in the blue are items that they consider are making sufficient progress. So if you had an opportunity to review uh, their evaluation, it's pretty succinct. They go through each of the recommendations um, with their feedback with either what the next step would be in their mind or um, why they deemed it to be complete. In the yellow here, you see that um, there's one item listed as complete, but additional consideration required. That is the contingency plan. Uh, they noted in their evaluation that the contingency plan met all of the requirements of Act 187 of 2018, but if it were to be implemented, they offered additional considerations around sustainability, around CMS oversight, and sort of just general policy considerations that, that one would, might, would wanna take into account um, when thinking about making a change. Should I? Okay, I'm going to keep going. All right. So I'm going to switch the HIE plan. Are there any other questions about the third party evaluation? <laughs> Great. So um, the seventh will be back to talk about the HIE plan um, at length, um, but I did. Just to sort of set the stage for that conversation, I did want to touch on a couple of things. Um, and, you know, just to kind of bring us back to the guiding principles that have uh, sort of uh, centered the work of the steering committee over the last 10 or so months. And the first was to give policymakers and regulators a document that illustrates the path forward for strategic vision and accountability. So, you know, a lot of this plan is about um, creating a sense of credibility, accountability, making sure that um, the right stakeholders are at the table together and talking about how HIE should be governed, investing 
invested in, managed going forward. So that's, that was really essential to the steering committee sort of ethos. Um, the next was to demystify health information exchange, and I think we've talked a lot about this, how a couple of years ago health information exchange was sort of a black box, misunderstood, um, and I think over the last few months uh, we've gained a lot of transparency and accountability around the work. The HIE plan is written very simply, very directly, in an effort to engage a broad range of stakeholders in the planning process and not leave anyone out who's impacted by health information exchange. Um, additionally, uh, the group really targeted the needs of people using the healthcare system, and that was the pr that is the primary focus of the HIE plan, not necessarily the technology. Technology is a tool, one of many, um, but the important thing about health information exchange is the outcomes that we are trying to achieve in terms of impacting health outcomes and the cost of care. So the HIE plan is wholly focused on the people who use the healthcare system and their needs. Um, and we talked about this, I think, last time. The steering committee um, really through their assessing user needs, engaging with stakeholders through use case process, discerned that um, there are kind of four pillars of the HIE ecosystem. And so the HIE plan focuses on maturing each of those pillars, their financing, policy and process, governance, and technology, and how where we are with each of those pillars in the ecosystem, how we need to mature, what the ideal state is, and what the challenges are in getting there. And finally, the HIE plan includes sort of, uh, not sort of, definitely a checklist, which we are calling a tactical plan. Um, and this is to make sure that, you know, there's really achievable progress. Folks know who's accountable for what in the next annual period. We can literally check the boxes and make sure that progress is, continues to be made. Okay, so this is a very simple timeline of next steps. So kind of in November, we're going to come back here and submit the, or November 1st, we'll be submitting the HIE plan to you. We'll be back November 7th. Ideally in December, the HIE plan is approved, not to influence you or anything, but that would be great. <laughs> um, in January, we're going to be inviting new steering committee members to join what we're calling the permanent HIE steering committee. We'll talk more about it on November 7th, but the, steering, the current steering committee is proposing to you a governance model. Um, we're keeping the name the same. <laughs> In February, we'll um, fully establish that steering committee, and in March, they'll begin their work in executing their tasks listed in that tactical plan. And then next November, we'll have an update to the HIE plan again. So that's it for me. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. it uh, appears that Biolite made great progress in the last eight months. What do you think um, has been the, the uh, thing that has surprised or pleased you the most in the last eight months? And what's your biggest fear or concern going forward? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, we've been able to make progress on a lot of different fronts, and that would not have been possible with, uh, without their partnership. Um, we've improved our contracting. Uh, deliverables have become much more uh, clear to stakeholders. Um, Vital's been really key uh, to helping us think through strategy that will benefit the entire healthcare system, um, lending their expertise in health information exchange and the operation of the health information exchange to the planning process. So the partnership has been really key. Um, and you know, you can't say enough about um, coming to the table and being willing to sort of do the hard work to get things done. And I think, you know, everybody who's been involved, every member of the steering committee has done that, including Vital, which has been really great. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, I don't think that's any secret. You know, it, Michael often says there's four key questions here when we think about sort of health information exchange strategy. First is, what does the state want or need in health information exchange? The second is, can our service providers, including Vital, meet those needs? The third is, are providers better off and our patients better? And the fourth is, are patients better off? And you know, we are certainly hitting on the first two. Um, through the steering committee we and through the HIE plan, we will really, I think, begin to um, clearly articulate what, this, what the next steps are in terms of the state's needs for health information exchange. We now have a clear process for holding vendors accountable for that, but we still have work to do in terms of really impacting providers' work and then, you know, most importantly, uh, impacting the health and well-being of Vermonters. Okay, questions for Emily?
I was going to ask you about the governance model and uh, sure. where that's where you're kind of landing on that, but if we're going to hear that on November 7th, you can skip that question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we will talk about it at, at length, but, you know, no secrets uh, that, you know, the steering committee has, and, and some of it is is covered in, in HDS's evaluation, the steering committee thought a lot about um, what made them successful and what made them able to come to a consensus-driven plan that they're really happy with, that they feel like is foundational to forward-moving progress. So they've offered a steering committee at the center of uh, of sort of, of governance and really clearly tried to explain who has an oversight role, how do we hold service providers accountable, and who does the steering committee go to um, for advice and uh, expertise, and that's going to be really fundamental to their work together. And what did you think about their recommendation to do a specific subcommittee about patient consent? Yeah, I feel like I thought that was like a little bit of a moment of like Vermont. We always say we're unique, and uh, in some cases, it's really true. <laughs> and so, you know, we have this group from out of state with um, from state great experts have worked at the state level, but generally in larger states. And so they came to us and they said, you know, you really need to have ad hoc committees to support your your sort of central steering committee. And everyone around our steering committee table agreed that there are already groups of experts that we can lean on, um, and they exist today and there's no reason to sort of exhaust the people who are already volunteering their time on these committees. Um, we just need to be really strategic about making sure we get on the schedules appropriately and planning our time accordingly. Great. Um, and then I had one other question which was, I know you're only a month and a half into your roadshow, but I was curious if uh, what you're hearing is consistent with the survey findings in the um, contingency plan around, um, specifically around having the HIE data in uh, the EMR and those other factors that they reported on in the contingency section. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think Kevin was at the um, primary care advisory group when we sat down with that group to talk about, from their perspective, from um, from the pr provider perspective, perspective, what do they really want to see out of this plan? And we heard a lot about frustrations with electronic health records and the desire for interoperability. Um, and so, you know, that's really rooted in, I'd say, like, just sort of oversimplifying it is, you know, when I'm a provider, I want to log into my computer and have every data point that I need right in front of my face, and I don't want it to be difficult or challenging to serve my patient. I want to be thinking about their care over the, the EHR. And most of the comments that we heard were, were grounded in that. So if you translate that or operationalize that, that is, I think, what Christina is talking about, which is a direct feed into an electronic health record from the VHI. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Tom? I don't really have a question. I just want to um, compliment both you and Vital on the progress you've made. Uh, uh, I was introduced to this um, situation a bit um, eight months ago. And uh, here we are down the road, and and uh, and looking at you know all of the kind of bureaucratic oversight that you've been maybe burdened with, some might say, but maybe it's been necessary. Your words. Of, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I can say those kind of things now, um, you know. Uh, but the contingency plans, the twice month, twice monthly reporting, the uh, having health uh, tech come in for uh, an evaluation. And for me, it all boils down now to almost a pages. I mean, it's a lot of work there, but it seems that you're you're on the road to where you want to go. Um, you've got the infrastructure put in place in terms of the contracts between Vital and and you folks that are based on performance. Um, and if you go to pages two through four of the final report of the health tech recent health tech evaluation, you can see uh, the shopping list, and I'm certain that. When we look at those 2019 contracts, we will see embedded in them the, um, the, 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 the portion of those 23 elements that haven't been completed yet, but you're clearly on the road um, in a very disciplined way uh, to get there. So I, uh, I applaud um, you know, what I've seen over the last eight months, as I, I think Kevin does as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Or if not, I'll open it up to the public for comments or questions. What an easy group. <laughs> you, got, you got let off the hook easy. Right? Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate all the work that you're doing.
Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest.